321, and we are live on the Metabolic Motivation Show and very excited to have Rohan, uh, or Rohan Jassini, who is a, a uh, young man who is uh, very deeply into the natural healing power of plants as food and medicine. And yep. uh, Rohan, welcome and thank you for uh, making time for us today. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. Rohan, can you for for those for people out there who aren't really familiar with uh, with the idea of, of herbs and herbal herbal medicine and uh, herbalist, yeah. tell us a little bit about your background and how, and how you got into this. Yeah, so uh, I'll try to give the the summary version, but it's been a long journey for me, um, probably about a ten year journey. And uh, I'll start with just giving you a little a quick explanation, a little bit about herbs and herbal medicine. Uh, herbal medicine has been used by every culture around the world, you know, for thousands of years, uh, beyond even written records. It's, it's, it's one of the oldest and one of the original forms of medicine that we had. So it's something that's universal um, and it's available universally. There's plants everywhere, just about on every part of Earth. So um, we as, as humans have been using plants to support and build health. Um, and in there are certain cases where in in certain cases where you have disease or something like that, you can use them specifically for that. But one of their most powerful ways to use them is to build health. And when you build health, you're kind of making, you're going in the opposite direction of where disease is sort of existing. So um, that's essentially at a very high level how herbs can be used and should be used to support the body. Um, my journey started, like I said, 10 years ago, uh, essentially I saw that there was, uh, it was essentially looking at the world and seeing things where I just didn't understand. I, I didn't. They didn't make sense to me. Um, whether it was the way that the world was operating um, on a global sense, um, down to the microcosm, um, and one of the areas is obviously health and the way we lived. Uh, whether it's you know not having community, uh, whether it's the foods that we ate, a lot of these sorts of things. So I started questioning, and ultimately, what ended up happening was I spent time going back to live in a traditional setting in a village where it was more like traditional pre-modern society, yes. and I saw that they lived very differently. Um, their lifestyle was different. Their diet, everything um, was different, and that's where I got exposed to herbs. And herbs are just one of many tools um, that I just gravitated towards in the plants, and so that's kind of. What I'm doing now is just to help get that information out there and show people that this can be this can be used and could be very powerful. Wow, that's uh, that's great. You know, I've I've had a, a little bit of a similar experience with uh, being here in Spain, and uh, there's still a lot of uh, there are over two thousand uh, villages that have less than less than ten thousand people per uh, per setting. Some of them much smaller than that, and there's still a lot yeah. of traditional uh, traditional culture and uh, habits that have that have resisted modern uh, pharmaceutical based, uh, you know, disease care, if you will. Yeah. So uh, fa wonderful. Well, let's, let's uh, touch on a few, a few things that people uh, might ask about uh, commonly mm -hmm. in the, in this area. For example, uh, why don't we just start off if, if you, if you had someone who was a lot of young people or, or maybe not so young and people, couples mm -hmm. in their thirties are, uh, this, you know, they're waiting to get, to uh, try to start a family and get pregnant, and having issues with that. Um, is there uh, are there some things um, that you might uh, might have some some tips for people who are wanting to deal with issues with that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with respect to fertility, uh, it's I mean, herbs are of an amazing option because the tools and, the, and the, what they provide is not something that you would get if you were to go through a conventional way of supporting or increasing fertility. Um, it's kind of like you're having a whole new set of tools with the herbs. They just work differently. So with respect to fertility, there's, uh, it's always, you know, in, in sort of a holistic paradigm, there's always multiple factors at play. So it could be things like stress that's involved. Um, uh, typically the physiology, when you look at stress physiology, one of the things that happens when you're stressed is reproduction is not that important when you're stressed. Yes. And so reproduction. You get the cortisol going and. Yeah, it, it's a very complicated, cascaded thing. But one of the things is reproduction, not important. So we're going to kind of like take resources away from reproduction. And if you're doing this a lot, um, it's going to affect fertility. So that's just one thing. Stress is one area. And herbs, there's herbs to help to buffer and support you when you are stressed. So um, that's one factor. Other factors could be what you're consuming in your diet. 
Um, other things could be people are on birth control, hormonal birth control for a long period of time. And when they get off, it throws their body in a sense out of whack and it needs support to get that cycle back. Right. Um, so that's an, that's like a third factor. Uh, diet is another one. Things like exercise can affect, um, like exercising too much can affect, um, a woman's cycles. And that's just on the female side. Then you got to look at the male side. And there's a lot of issues with male fertility because that's obviously part of it too. Sure. Um, sometimes you know, the woman could be perfectly fine and then the, the male side where, for instance, things like the sperm isn't as mo motile as it should be. So it can't you know, make that marathon over to impregnate the egg or maybe um, the sperm count is less. Yeah. Some of the things re regarding that, the environment is a big deal today. Um, a lot of the, you know, they use the term toxicity, um, things like heavy metals. Uh, there's a lot of other things that can come in that disrupt the body in its normal processes. And so that's another a fourth or fifth factor. So herbs can help in all of those um, situations. Would you like me to just speak to some, some of the ways? Yeah, please. That would, yes, please. Okay. So as far as stress goes, uh, so the st what's causing the stress uh, you, the herbs aren't going to fix that. What they're going to do is they're going to give your body more sort of a capacity to deal with the stressor. So the stressor's impact on the body isn't as much. Right. So, so it's not getting at the root cause, but it's supporting, in a sense, the body so it can deal with the stressor some more. Um, so, for instance, there's a whole class of herbs that a lot of people are familiar with known as adaptogens. Adaptogens, yes. There you go. Yeah, so that, the adaptogens. Just took uh, I just took one t uh, about an hour ago. <laughs> okay, I think it was. Yeah, the, the, maybe I'm. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. The um, ashwagandha. Ashwagandha. Yeah. Ashwagandha. Okay. Yeah, and that it, it, the adaptogens are uh, what some people would term the elite class of herbs because uh, they do things in the body that are just uh, we haven't been able to even capture in any sort of model um, accurately what they do, but the results are there. Um, they work primarily through some of the control systems, so like the endocrine system, the nervous system, which are and the immune system, which are pervasive. They're not, you know, they're all over the body, and they they're like sort of command and control. So if they're operating at that level, um, they tend to affect a whole bunch of things in the body. So one of the things, in a very simple way, is they help to buffer stress. Yes. Um, ashwagandha particularly has a relaxing effect. So um, if you're somebody that maybe gets anxious a lot. And over a long period of time, that can push your system out of balance. Ashwagandha is something that can help nourish it and get it back into balance while kind of keeping you relaxed. So your ability to, to operate in the world um, is sort of enhanced because you can deal with the stress more. Oh, yeah. No question. Yeah. So that's like one example. And the other advantage about ashwagandha with respect to fertility is it has a tradition in the Ayurvedic. It's from India. It's an Indian Ayurvedic herb. Yeah. Um, it's known as a reproductive tonic. So it's been used for fertility um, as far as traditional use goes. Okay, that was, that was interesting. I hadn't really seen, I had seen a study where showing a positive correlation with uh, testosterone. So I guess that would certainly, that would sort of fit in with the fer fertility as well. Uh, um, it's tricky because, uh, so the thing is, is, you know, there, a, so the study is one, there's not, whole lot there's more research today than there was before um but it's still there's holes in the research so there's a lot that hasn't been uncovered and uncovered the other interesting thing about herbs especially in adaptogen is what it does is very contextual so what it'll do in you and somebody else is different right okay because it's 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 going there and it's creating balance within your system versus somebody else and you're you're whatever you're your imbalances might be different sure. um, without getting into the science. So in certain situations, for instance, it could adjust testosterone in one way in one person. It could do it differently in another person. Does okay. that make sense? Sure. Sure. So it's, yeah, it's, so it's, it's going to be specific to the, the individual biochemistry or of that of each person, I guess that would. Yeah. To a certain extent. Um, it does have some overall trends, but it's not as easy as just to say, oh, it always does this to this hormone in this setting because they're just, there's, you know, when you take ashwagandha, it's thousands of chemicals um, in that plant that interact. And then within that, then you're taking it into a unique person. So it's going to do different things.
Right. Yeah, it's fasc a fascinating subject. Actually, I, um, I this is I'm this is my third week of experimenting with it, and yeah. uh, I've also noticed uh, a, a positive effect on sleep, uh, a bit deeper sleep, and uh, more yeah. a bit more vivid dreams and dream retention. Have you noticed an asso any association like that? Um, I have heard, I, I've definitely heard feedback um, clinically from people saying, yes, they have much better sleep, deeper sleep, and more dreams. So um, as far as the retention piece, I haven't heard that comment, but um, it's definitely possible. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm, and I'm not sure if it wasn't, if I wasn't dreaming before uh, as much, not getting that REM stage, or if I'm just retaining it more, I'm, you know, it's hard to say, but, uh, anyway, yeah, fascinating, fascinating topic. Well, anything, any other herbs that, that people might want to look into regarding fertility? Yeah. So there's, that's just, um, working with the, the, the stress factor in that whole picture. Um, uh, another factor could be, um, I mentioned birth control and all these other factors throwing off essentially the female reproductive system, particularly the cat, you know, the sort of orchestration of all the endocrine hormones yes. um, that involve like all the estrogens and um, progesterone and all that. So there's an herb, uh, it's called Vitex agnus castus or right. chaseberry. Chaseberry. Mm -hmm. Chaseberry. There you go. Yes. Yeah. And so that's one that's used a lot. Um, it's, it's termed as a sort of a hormone normalizer. Yes. So uh, when you use the term normalize, it essentially typically refers to taking something that maybe might be in excess or or under uh, or deficient and it brings it back into balance so you know if you were a person where you had something this particular aspect of you that was in excess and in me it was deficient the same herb can bring it into balance um right Interesting. so yeah and so within a within the female uh within if you're trying to work with fertility that's one thing to get um, the hormones basically in sync because there's just a whole bunch of stuff that's going on. Right. Uh, so, it may, so, it's used so maybe to, estrogen would just be perhaps estrogen and progesterone looking for that, that sweet spot. Yeah. For that particular person, whatever the sweet spot would be with respect to if you had ideal fertility, this is how your hormones would be kind of going up and down along your cycle. Um, it would help to get that back into that rhythm and when you have that rhythm is when you're going to be most fertile wow. and sometimes if that rhythm is out of sync or a level for instance you said progesterone if that's not at the level it should be at this stage of your cycle you're going to have a reduced probability of of you know getting pregnant so that's essentially how that particular herb can be used with respect to fertility well Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Anything else to add with um, about as far as fertility or libido or anything like that? Um, yeah, and libido would be. I mean, ashwagandha could help. There's two other ones. Maca is one that's gained a lot of popularity recently. It's from South America. Um, it's a root, and um, it has aphrodisiac pro uh, uh, properties, but it's also like sort of. It's also been considered a sexual tonic. Um, so something helping in that area. Uh, another one is Damiana, which is, I'm pretty sure it's native to North America. Uh, there might be similar species in other parts of the world, but I'm pretty sure it's native to North America. And that's also has qualities as, of being a, an aphrodisiac. Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Uh, any, how about, um, uh, if if there was if there if there was anything uh, I'm trying to think there was another one that that was a med more of a Mediterranean thing that uh, uh -huh. that had I had been someone had mentioned to me it uh, uh, what well, it was not ro um, rosemary perhaps oh interesting rosemary yeah wow. now this this is a, a totally an anecdotal thing uh, I was in an I was in an organic market a few weeks ago it happened to be talking to someone about uh, when on this topic and they mentioned uh, rosemary as having some, some positive properties with uh, regards to fertility and libido and things like that. I had never run across that before. So it was, but it was, uh, it was, it, it, it's, uh, I don't, th I don't think it's I, I, looking at online. I did not really see anything about that either, but. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, if you take an herb, it's, it's such a complex entity and, 
you know, there's all sorts of uses for it. So just whatever, whatever the evidence says is not the totality of what the herb can do. Sure. Um, it's an, uh, we won't be able to know everything that it can do because it's so complex. But um, with whatever knowledge I have, the only thing I could think of that maybe rosemary could benefit for is um, some say that it's very beneficial for circulation. Right. Um, and circulation is essentially like what feeds basically all your tissues, all your cells. So sure. if with respect to fertility, you're having issues with any of the female organs where there's circulation issues um, in the pelvic area, maybe I'm just, I'm drawing, I'm being very hypothetical here. If it helps circulation in that region, then that's maybe why potentially rosemary could be beneficial. Yeah. Interesting. Of course, of course, if it was on the male side and you had a, uh, you know, this and you, Obviously, without good circulation, things aren't gonna things aren't gonna work very well. So uh, yes, it can help on the male side too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, fascinating stuff. Fantastic. Well, let's change gears a little bit to um, uh -huh. you know from uh, fertility uh, to uh, maybe if we talk a little bit about the immune system and uh, the uh, trying to to help people with uh, immune system to prevent diseases. Any, anything you could share with us uh, on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, immune system, extremely complex. <laughs> it's, it's amazing um, what we have. So a lot of what the herbs are going to do with respect to the immune system is to, is um, you can probably divide it up into sort of maybe let's just say three categories. Um, in some situations, you might need to, to poke it, to provoke it, because maybe that person, based on the way they're living, um, their immune system just isn't as vital, as responsive as it needs to be. And so in certain situations, you might have an onset of a cold. And if, you ha if you're a person that just your immune system isn't that um, responsive, you can use something like echinacea. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it hasn't traditionally, it doesn't have that tradition of being used in colds and flus. Uh, it's more of a modern thing. But um, that's one area where you could use echinacea. And it's got a stimulant property. So where it's going to stimulate aspects more of a aspects of the immune system. So that's one piece of it. Um, other times there's what some would call a dysregulation in the immune system. And some people associate that to what we call today. We see this, um, the basic autoimmunity. Yes. Uh, so another perspective on autoimmunity is essentially, which is still a vague word is there's a dysregulation in the immune system. Um, and if you think about the immune system, it's, it's spread out through the entire body and it's this constant dialogue and it's not a single organ. It's this, it, it's this amorphous kind of thing that's in flux is always dynamic and changing. And there's a lot of regulation that goes on in there. And so if the regulation for whatever reasons, um, and there's many factors that could be involved there is off, you could maybe get this sort of thing where it's like, Hey, what I'm not supposed to be attacking is me, but due to the dysregulation, I can't tell anymore. And so right. I start attacking myself. Um, and so that is part of it. And some also would characterize it as sometimes you have an autoimmunity, you have a increase in your immune activity and a decrease in your immune activity. And it's fluctuating sometimes. Okay. So we have a category of herbs called um, immune amphoterics, and they're essentially like, like normalizers. They have a, have a way of essentially helping to bring things basically back into into sort of proper regulation. So those could be another category of herbs that would be beneficial in certain situations. And then the last one would be um, situations where uh, you have essentially maybe just, you know, maybe an excess in sort of um, an immune response. And so inflammation, not like acute inflammation, which is good. You want that. Um, a sort of inappropriate infl inflammation, which would be more like a, of a chronic nature. Yes. So in that situation, something that you would want is maybe something like turmeric or boswellia, uh, which have a lot of research behind them. Um, and the mechanisms with which they work through the body are numerous. Um, so and they're just they're they're amazing. And then you can get them just about everywhere. <laughs> so. Well, and there's 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 also a uh, seems to be some synergy between the turmeric and black pepper. Can you, is there, so, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So black pepper, there's, uh, so black pepper, I'll go back to the tradition first. Um, if you look at the tradition, black pepper and turmeric come from the Ayurvedic tradition. Yes. Um, so they have a long history in India of, of use and they've figured out, um, they have their own sort of alchemical ways of processing these herbs. Um, 
and to increase their bioavailability, their absorption, and the time that they stay in the body. So I'll give you an example. Uh, black pepper and also its cousin long pepper um, have been used in a lot of Ayurvedic formulations in small amounts, primarily to increase the efficacy of the formula that it's with. And so what modern science has done is investigated that some, and they realize that there's a compound in black pepper and also in long pepper called piperine. Um, and piperine essentially, um, the liver, when you take things in, the liver is always scanning and filtering things out. And it has a set of enzymes that do this. Um, piperine goes in there and mucks with it so that it doesn't filter some of these compounds out. Oh, and I so see. what happens is, is turmeric comes in and it's not filtered out as fast, the constituents of turmeric, and they get into the body. Oh, I see. Fascinating. So turmeric, um, not curcumin, turmeric. Curcumin is just a part of turmeric. Um, turmeric is a much better, uh, if, if it's prepared in that way, with black pepper and then also with fats, uh, any type of fat, is one, going to get absorbed way more and is also going to stay in the body longer. Um, something like curcumin is um, comes in the body and it goes out of the body fast. So um, m using the whole plant, is this is a prime example where using the whole plan is going to be better. Okay, fascinating. So, th so that's a that would that's something I think a lot of people aren't aware of. You know, when we do talk about uh, herbs, I mean, we oftentimes people will go to their supermarket, they'll buy an herbal tea, and they'll <laughs> think, oh yeah, you know, I did the, I took a, um, um, you know, a mint tea today, and uh, for my digestion or something. And I'm yeah. oftentimes wondering how, you know, in the commercial tea bag, if there's really much of, I guess it would vary quite a lot. But, uh, but in an ideal world, what, uh, would it be best to have the full plant and then, and, you know, compared to the other end of the spectrum being, you know, a commercial tea bag? Yeah, I mean, so when I say full plant, the whole herb, uh, for each plant, you also got to look at the part that was used. Um, there's certain plants you don't want to use, like if it's the root, if you try to use the leaf, sometimes the leaf is poisonous, but the root is fine. So you need to know which part is used. For instance, peppermint, we don't use the root of peppermint. There's no, to my knowledge, and there's no history of it, typically the leaf is used. And the stem is actually used too. It's kind of all mashed, mashed together. So you need to know the part. And usually when you get an herbal tea, they've already kind of figured all that out. Right. Um, then it depends, is the tea sort of a pleasure like a food kind of item or is this being marketed as something that's more of like a medicinal tea and typically the difference one of the differences is going to be the dose so the tea bag will have a lot more peppermint in it um, it might have some other things versus a flavored tea will just have a much smaller dose so it'll help maybe with gas and bloating um, the medicinal tea might have a stronger effect okay does that make sense yes yeah but yeah, certainly, certainly, fantastic, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Let's let's uh, change it. Well, we just talked about you know things for the immunity and for and inflammation. Is there anything else that uh, you'd want to add as regard you know regarding the immune system or you know if you had um, you know almost well these days for example almost everyone I know has someone in their family with cancer and they're usually yeah. you know doing a conventional treatment uh, but they may want to you know, they may ask me sometimes, you know, what would you do to support that? And, and, uh, is there any, any tips that, uh, you might give? Yeah. Um, I, I particularly don't have a lot of experience working with, um, you know, patients that have cancer, but what I do know, um, is one, you definitely, you should definitely work in conjunction with your doctor because sometimes the, um, the approaches are, um, opposite because sometimes what, um, conventionally is, is, yeah. What they're trying to do is, in some cases, they don't want the immune system to come up um, because it's just a part of the approach. And it has its benefits, you know, in situations. Um, and if you come in and you try to start using some other herbs that are doing the opposite, right. um, it could cause some issues. So, um, and it, cancer is a very complicated thing. There are herbs that can help. Um, the only thing is, I don't know. It's it's just a lot more complicated than right. Well, let's leave that you know. for another another yeah. another future interview, perhaps. Uh, yeah. It is a very complicated subject. I, I know that uh, I can mention that, that uh, one of the uh, one doctor friend I have has who's been studying it a little bit uh, briefly, uh, and she 
she told me at dinner the other night that uh, dandelion was uh, had some. She had seen some studies about dandelion um, being beneficial to support uh, to support cancer patients, uh, but um, we didn't really go deeper than that. It was a it was a pretty fun dinner with a lot of a uh, lot of great food and food and wine and music. And the music was starting, and it was time to dance a little bit. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, dandelion is uh, it. The root, um, the leaf too, but uh, the root has a, an affinity for the liver. Um, and so in a sense, it kind of optimizes function. So for instance, it will help bile production. It will also help the stimulation of the liver to l- release bile. Yes. So, you know, typically conventional treatment, if, it's, if there's chemotherapy involved, the liver is going to be pretty taxed because um, chemotherapy is really, it's really toxic. And so... The liver is like, you, we need to get this out of the body. So it's working overtime. So um, dandelion could be useful, but I, I really don't know because sometimes if it helps the liver dump whatever it's filtering out, it can overwhelm the system. I see. So that's why I'm, I'm hesitant to say anything because I don't have the clinical experience of working in those situations. So um, herbs overall are general, but it's always you got to look at what's going on with the person and everything like that. So um does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah, by all means. And, and just to reiterate yeah. just what you had mentioned earlier, too, I think it's important for anyone who's listening to this to always consult with your physician uh, because, you know, there could be some interaction that, uh, that you know, Absolutely. with the medications and things like that. And it's that would so I think that's that stands without I think most people know that, but it's always good to to just yeah. get that out there again. So uh, Absolutely. so wonderful. Okay, well let's let's uh, switch over to a, an easier subject, actually, and an even more common problem, which, uh, in fact, almost um, I would say, in almost uh, uh, from my experience in doing health coaching with people, w- at mm-hmm. least uh, eight out of ten, if not nine out of ten, people would uh, would complain of of a lack of energy at times, uh, mm-hmm. even you know, which yeah. might go into fatigue or even chronic fatigue. Uh, in a, in less in less cases, but uh, certainly is an issue that's growing. It maybe it's related to toxicity. Maybe it's related to, of course, to lack of uh, good sleep habits and you know poor nutrition. We you know we kind of know that. But um, if you had someone complaining of problems with uh, you know with low energy and maybe fatigue, uh, any any ideas of, of possibilities that uh, you could look at? Yeah, I mean this. And it, uh, like you said, it, it's going to go back to looking at what's going on in their picture. So um, if I'll just give a couple examples, maybe someone comes in and um, sleep happens to be the main factor. I would probably use herbs to support their sleep. So they're not necessarily for fatigue, but by supporting their sleep, the fatigue can go away. Yes. Make sense? Um, another situation could be, uh, I mean, anemia is another thing that could be causing fatigue. Right. Um, so. That would come out in blood work. Um, pretty, you know, a standard blood um, blood labs would show you that. And then you'd have to investigate why are they anemic, and there's many reasons for that. Um, uh, one offhand could just be they're not, you know, they're uh, they're deficient um, in iron, and if they're having digestive issues, maybe maybe it's because they're not taking enough enough in from their diet, um, or there could be some sort of bleeding somewhere in the body. There's all sorts of reasons for that. And you can give herbs for all those different things. So if, it's, if, if, if the fatigue can be traced to anemia, which means that they're deficient, possibly in iron, and it's related to digestion, then you can work on their digestion. And as a result, they'll start to absorb normal amounts of iron, however much they're supposed to. The body knows what, it's, you know, what it needs to do. So um, maybe that will take care of it. So that's two examples of where herbs would be used. Um, and I'll just give one more. Um, the other one would just, the other one would be really like, um, the stress. Uh, what stress does is, uh, it taxes the body more than it should be. It's, it's typically in a very, in a very simplistic term in terms, um, it's a response that's not supposed to be used a lot by the body. And when you use that response a lot, which requires a lot of resources over time, What's in what's in, what's required by the body to, to initiate that response starts getting taxed, right. and so what you what you end up happening what ends up happening is is you just don't have the the sort of energy to kind of keep going because 
you know, these these organs that are supposed to keep you moving in a sense. This is a very simplistic explanation too, by the way. Yeah, um, no, no, it's good though. Can't keep up with your regular daily demands. Like you should be able to have X amount of energy, but if you keep, you know, using resources above that, eventually it's like I can't keep up. So now I'm going to kind of go X minus ten. You know, I'm going to be less. So that's a, that's a third area, uh, third three different pictures in a sense of how fatigue can show up. So. And I can speak to some herbs in each of the categories. I imagine that's going to be interesting, right? Yeah, yeah, please do. Please do. Yeah, so for instance, in the sleep situation, um, to support sleep, you already mentioned one, ashwagandha. Um, so, and what's interesting about ashwagandha is it would help in, this, in the sleep, but it would also help uh, with respect to the stress. So you have a win-win on both those, um, if those are two factors for this particular person. Um, other herbs for sleep uh, would be uh, there's we have sedative herbs which are stronger and kind of put you to sleep. Then we have another class of herbs called nervines, which essentially you can think of them as food for the nervous system, um, and they tend to have a relaxing effect. So an herb in that category could be something like um, passion flower, mm -hmm. um, and that particularly helps in sleep. Um, particular types of insomnia um, respond well to to using passion flower. Um, and then I think I was saying, yeah, the Nervine. And then as far as the sedative, common ones that are used a lot, something like valerian is used a lot. Valerian, yes. Yeah, my wife has used some valerian from time to time. Yeah. So that's another one that I could use. And that's sort of a more of an unsedative category because it's just going to kind of force you in a sense. That's the way I see it, force you to sleep. So those are two areas where they can help with sleep. Okay. That's that's If that's one of the reasons why you're fatigued. The other one... Um, I'm forgetting what did I say the second category was. Um, Let's see. Wait, um, sleep, uh, sleep, nutrition, uh, stress. Um, yeah, stress. We can jump to the stress one. I'm blanking on the second one, but the, the third one I mentioned was uh, stress. So I'd mentioned uh, ashwagandha and adaptogen that can help with that. Um, and then going back to the nervines, we have things that can help relax. Um, so something like uh, skullcap. Yeah, passion power could be used as well. Skullcap is another one. Um, that one typically it's it's relaxing, so something you would take regularly to kind of help make you less. Um, I don't know if I want to say less stressed, but um, your sort of normal tone is kind of more of in a relaxed state. Yeah. So you're more centered. In a sense, you're more centered. Okay. What? Yeah. So those are two areas. Let me see if I can remember the um, the third one for fatigue. Oh, I think I said I described anemia, right? Well, it could be anemia. Yeah. Yeah. So with anemia, if, for instance, in that situation, it's because this person has an impaired digestion and that's causing basically a lack of absorption of iron. And then over time, what ends up happening is iron stores go down, et cetera, et cetera, and you're now in anemia. So what you need to do is you need to correct the digestion so your body can get iron when it needs it from your GI tract. So then it just depends on what's going on with your digestion. And there's a lot of herbs for that. So um, there could be herbs that are sort of what they're they're called demulsant herbs they're gooey mm -hmm. um so what they tend to do is they have a an ability to coat the lining of the intestine um and then also um they essentially have a healing quality so a lot of the even external topical ones have this gooey quality and they're just healing to tissue um so two herbs like that are licorice and marshmallow oh really licorice and yeah. marshmallow yeah i mean you, this is something you can just Put some uh, marshmallow or licorice in water and see what the consistency is like, and you'll see that it's kind of gooey. Um, yeah. And there's, it's not just that we're saying this based on the fact that it's gooey. Um, there's research that supports that, and then there's obviously you'll see it clinically where you use these, and they have a tradition of being used in this way. Um, so those two that could be used, you know, upwards to help fatigue could be even things as a something like a turmeric because if there's an inflammation going on in your, your GI tract. Um, there could be other things like using bitters, things like you mentioned dandelion or burdock, um, something like that to stimulate digestion, to properly process what you're taking in so that it gets, because it's kind of like, if you think about the, the GI tract, it's kind of like a, like a factory, right? It goes through all these steps and then at that last step, it's like, all right, I can take it into the body. If you skip one or two steps, how are you going to get to the last step? And so you have something that the body's like, look, I can't take this in. So you end up basically not absorbing as much of your food as you should. Over time, that's going to 
that's going to result in deficiencies uh, to other to various things. It could be iron. So yeah. bitters are something that kind of help make sure that we're not skipping steps in a sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. By all means. Yeah, I like that analogy. So the digestion being like a like a factory, a multi-stage factory, and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's a great point. You can actually be. Uh, I've had you know clients of mine who were actually. You know, we were doing detailed food diaries, and they were eating very well, high quality, you know, natural foods, and um, and still did not notice, didn't notice much of a, a change of uh, energy. And then later on, we determined it was exactly that. It was actually uh, um, we learned to ask them, "Hey, what what about your digestion?" And they all, you know, generally had digestive issues. And uh, so there you go. So it's not just what you eat; it's what you absorb and what you digest. So, yeah, uh, I mean, di di yeah, digestion is, uh, it's huge. I mean, that's actually one of the areas I focus on and I'm fo focusing on more with my practice is just because you just do some simple changes to your digestion and if you enhance it, it just percolates throughout your entire well-being. Like it just supports all your systems. So it's the core, um, it's definitely a core system as far as health. Yes, wonderful stuff. So Wonderful stuff. Well, let's... Yeah. Um, so we've talked about uh, we talked about fertility, immune system, reducing inflammation, re overcoming fatigue, and uh, let's uh, talk a bit about uh, memory and memory loss. Um, mm. How um, is that something you, that you uh, that you focused on um, on memory loss or or regaining memory or supporting memory? Yeah, I mean it. it memory loss shows up. Once again, for various reasons, um, in different pictures. So, uh, just you know, it could be situations where someone maybe is um, at an age where they are getting towards a what maybe you would consider an elderly age, and so naturally memory does go down. But maybe it's kind of like a little bit earlier than it should. Um, so, there's things that that could be used to support um, basically the brain in a sense. Uh, increasing circulation up here is one of the ways that it works. Um, some of these herbs work. Um, other, other herbs that, like I mentioned, the nervines that h tend to feed, they're like food for the nervous system. Um, so that kind of helps. Um, there could be other situations where, or essentially hormonally or, um, related to maybe the thyroid or some other, um, other, or other glands, a side effect of that or a symptom could be memory loss or not memory loss, more like you can't forget. I mean, you keep forgetting um, your memory, things that you're like, wow, I just, the short term memory is reduced. There's, there's a lot of little details there. Um, and there's herbs, some herbs that would, you could take to essentially support the system. And as a result, your memory can improve. So there's one that comes to mind, Bacopa. Um, and there's another one called Gota Cola. These are both Ayurvedic herbs. Yes. Um, they, so they have a tradition of being used to support um, a variety of things in the body, but one area for sure um, is is up in the in the head region, the brain, and with respect to memory and whatnot. So those have been used for that. Um, so those are two. Another one that you mentioned, uh, rosemary. Rosemary, oh, that's right. So because it has the, the uh, promotes good circulation. So yeah, and then also I, I forget what the other mechanisms are behind rosemary, but um, I think it has a it has a rich tradition of being used for like used like that. And in fact, I think the tradition was um, elderly people, and I think I, I think this was somewhere in Europe. Um, rosemary was incorporated into the food more during that I think during that time of life as a means to support memory, um, yeah, which I, is the best way to take your herbs. Interesting. I I know you you still see it in Spain as a traditional herb, especially with roasted meat. Roasted lamb, for example, yeah. um, and uh, and also with traditional stews. There's a traditional stew here might have chickpeas and um, you know a lot of vegetables. And, uh, um, and Spain has one of the longest lifespans in the world, so it's, it's right up there with Italy as far as Europe goes. And uh, mm. so those those are the kinds of things that the young people are not eating as much of. So they're not yeah. getting the herbs that the grandparents were getting. Yeah, it's a big it's a big disservice to um to the future. It's unfortunate, but I can uh, walk out just right outside um within oh, 25 steps from my house to uh I live in a residential area um here in southern outside of a of uh Seville, Spain, um mm -hmm. which is 
And then I'm up in Madrid a lot as well. We have a high-speed train. But literally 20 steps away, I've got rose in a, in a park, just wild rosemary all over the place. And the funny thing is, is that people, most people don't use that, though. They, would, they might go to an herbal store if they were so inclined and buy, you know, the, um, the pill, you know, a, a concentrated pill version for $20, $25 or something. And it's just all over the place. It's, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, food is definitely for, uh, there's a category of, of herbs like the culinary herbs. Yeah. You're incorporating them into food. There's certain herbs you don't, you don't want to take regularly. You just take them when you need them. Um, but rosemary is one of those. Yeah. Take it regularly. I mean, when you put it into food, and it's your own rosemary, um, you have the whole process of your, from the smell that you're getting. In a capsule, you're not getting any smell. Right. Um, and, and one of the, I think some of the theory is that herbs that tend to have a very aromatic smell have an action on the, on the brain of some sort. And that's why they're sometimes relaxing. And that's what some people say how rosemary, one of the ways it operates on the brain is you're getting the, the aroma. Ah, oh, that's fascinating. Well, you know, that would... Um... That would also connect one of the one of the things that I've have gotten turned on to here a little bit is uh, Spain has a lot of traditional festivals. They're usually, um, you know, old religious traditions that uh, a lot of people don't really aren't really that religious, but they can, are culturally very into the traditions. So, mm. for example, they have what's called Holy Week here, the Catholic week before Easter, and there's a lot of processions, and they typically use rosemary with other herbs. In, and they have them uh, dried, and they're carried through the streets, and they're uh, in a in kind of a um, I don't know the exact word for it, but it would be a metal recipient with a chain, and uh, it's an incense holder. That's the word. Yeah, it's smoking. Yeah, exactly. So they and you can actually you know find these. Um, this is quite common. Um, and in fact, some of the festivals they call um, they call they use the uh, at the, on the sides of the altars they would put you know just stacks and stacks of rosemary. Mm. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's they probably have a bunch of other reasons why they use it. That I mean, we. I mean, I would have no clue because I am not from Spain, but um, you know, a long tradition of using that that herb. So. Yeah, so the aromatic, that's an interest. that's a great point you made, the aromatic aspect. So, well, there, there's the well, whole the, the field that I know nothing about, really, but aromatherapy, which yeah. I guess goes into much more detail with, with that whole area, so. Yeah, I mean, it's just, and that's a portion you could, you might be able to group into herbal medicine, but it's its own entity because it's particularly only working with one aspect of the plant, the, the, the basically the volatile oils, which... Well, just in the air, well, that's why you smell the aroma is because they, without heat or anything, they'll just go into the air. And they're basically, you know, concentrating them into essential oils. So, um, and they have particular, they're beneficial in particular uses, you know. Yeah, so. well, you know, that, that kind of connects with one of the, one of the things that, um, that'll, you know, sort of changing, changing the topic slightly, but the idea that uh, everything, uh, um, a lot, well, a lot of the, a lot of the new, um, holistic health care that I'm running across uh, the experts will talk about uh, the fact that we, we have to be conscious that we can absorb, as you were saying, we, we absorb um, chemicals, both positive and negatively, um, you know, from not just by what we eat or breathe, but also by what we smell and what we put on our, on our skin. Uh, yeah. uh, is that something you might, uh, you could speak to, um, you know, as far as, de- because uh, some of these, pro- you know, we dealing with, with some of the other uh, uses of herbs is, um, with regard to skin care and, and things like that? Yeah. Uh, so there is, is a rich tradition the world over of using herbs topically uh, for therapeutic reasons. And um, that tradition is there because they realize when you put something on your skin, it goes in and it helps. So um, that is definitely the case. So stuff going in when you want it to. So why wouldn't stuff that you don't want that also would go in too. Yes. So if you put on a product that isn't natural, whatever is in there is going in. Um, now, if you get into the chemistry and stuff like that, there might be like, oh yeah, this molecule doesn't, and this does because of this. But generally speaking, your skin isn't it, it isn't like a um, a flat surface that stops everything. It, it, it's protective, but it does let in other things because it also lets out sweat. It's an ex, it's a excretory organ also in the body. So um, as far as herbs to 
there's er a lot of herbs that are used topically. Um, they could be used for all sorts of things, whether it's just, you know, cosmetically dry skin, just to moisturize your skin. It could be used for any sort of trauma, like injuries, that sort of thing, whether it's surface level trauma or even fractures or tears to tendon or that sort of thing. Um, and so, for instance, for internal injuries, a lot of times what uh, one of the strategies is to, to, to move blood. Yes. You know, blood is this, this nourishing thing. It brings in nutrients. It also takes away waste. If you can optimize that, you're going to facilitate healing. And so that's like a strategy that traditionally has been used. And so you would use herbs that um, can essentially, in a way, they kind of irritate the skin. So they bring to that irritation, they bring sort of blood there, provoke inflammation in a sense. Um, they do that internally too. Um, so that's one way that they go about. And then they also have compounds that stimulate cell growth. Um, uh, different herbs do that. Like I think uh, comfrey has comfrey is one herb that's used like that um, for internal injuries. Um, let's see what else. Calendula also is used um, more topically, like or for more topical for the skin related things. Comfrey helps there too, but it also helps internally. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And and we need, um, on that topic with skin, but but slightly, uh, but in a specific area. As far as mm -hmm. uh, as the um, dental health, is there anything uh, dental health and uh, you know with toothpaste and there's also a lot of herbal toothpaste out there. Uh, yeah, can you can you speak to any speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I particularly I don't use any toothpaste. I haven't used toothpaste in two years. Um, I have my own herb powder that I put together um, for many reasons. Um, I can give you, I can kind of walk through why and what my herb powder Yeah, please do. Uh, We'd love to. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I can't say it's going to be as tasty as a peppermint toothpaste or sure. the experience as clean. Um, it is a little messy, but, um, I'll break down kind of all the benefits of what I have in mind. So, um, and you can do this with very, very common herbs, very cheap, um, and just a few. Um, so some of the activity is the herbs that are in there are antimicrobial. Mm-hmm. Um, not like an antibiotic where they just basically come through and they blow everything away. Um, they have sort of selective antimicrobial capabilities. So then certain strains they'll, you know, kill. And sometimes um, it's, and I don't know where this, where the research is to show this, but what, what I was taught was that it prefers to sort of um, kill or more, more like destroy or whatever uh, the more pathogenic bacteria as opposed to the beneficial ones. Yes. Um, so there's a sort of a preference in a sense. So there's that. Um, and your, your mouth is always kind of all producing that. It's part of the ecosystem. So this is kind of helping support proper balance in there. Um, other things is, is there's astringent qualities, so to tighten tissue. Um, because if your tissue is very lax, um, it's not going to be beneficial. You're going to have receding gums, a variety of other things. Things can get stuck in your gums. So this helps to tighten the tissue. It also helps to that sort of counter irritation, so bring blood flow there. Um, it also stimulates saliva, which wow. is a very natural, good mechanism. The other thing it does is, um, it also somehow stimulates a lot of mucus production in these other regions here. So what will end up happening after I, br while I'm using my tooth powder, it'll help kind of pr have mucus production, you know, doesn't sound so pleasant, but up here so that it drains. And so you can you're getting this regular maintained cleaning twice a day of all your areas here. And so that's just going to support better health in the long term. Because if you don't clean, you know, these areas out here, because it's constantly filtering air. Yes. It's like a filter. You don't clean out the filter regularly, it's going to get built up and it's going to be not as strong as, as it's supposed to be. And then you're more likely to maybe get sick. So my tooth powder, that's just some of the things that um, it also has things like for analgesic properties. So if you do have any pain, it can help with that. Um, it's also the physical texture of it can help to get into crevices and clean it. Um, so... I've heard good things from the dentist that I go to, but that's yeah. just uh, well, my you've story. Got, you've got us intrigued now, so yeah, it, it sound the prop it sound the properties sound wonderful. Yeah, I think it's amazing, and there are herbal powders on the market, um, but you know it's it's so tricky because um, you know you've got big organizations that are like you know this is what we've seen that works, and this and this um, herbal powders have been used by villages around the world people around the world you know you go anywhere and they'll be like they used to maintain their teeth and they used herbs so you know they, they can be effective yeah could you share uh could you share some of your 
some of your recipe with us or is it or is it yeah uh, i i i'm very spontaneous with my creation so um i kind of like whatever's coming to my mind i just toss in there and i use it um some of the things that i have in there baking soda mm -hmm. um i do have some salt um sea salt because it has other minerals which is I use, you know i do a lot of sea salt that's my base <laughs> okay yeah sea salt's good better than you know table salt because you're getting um you're getting all these other trace minerals which is what you want yeah um so those are two that I have um, in there. Then I have things like uh, marshmallow mm -hmm. um, and licorice, yes. um, primarily because they've got that sort of gooey quality. So they're going to stimulate mucus production uh, within your mouth, um, uh, which is good for the gums and just normal part of, uh, of your mouth. Um, but the, actually, the other interesting thing is, is they have an ability to kind of stimulate mucus production in other parts of the body. Um, it's something that people have noticed clinically, um, they haven't un uh, uncovered the mechanism. So just because you're taking something here doesn't mean it's not affecting other parts of your body. Yes. It actually is. And so that's a, that's something that happens with these things, marshmallow and licorice, but also with bitters. Bitters, you take, as soon as you hit your mouth, boom, you're, there's all sorts of stuff that's happening up and down your GI tract. So just the process of brushing your teeth, you're working your body out. So um, those are two other herbs. I have some cloves in there. Um, cloves are antimicrobial. Yes. Do you um, grind it up or? Yeah, this is all powdered. All powdered. No. Yeah. So cloves is another one I have. Not a lot of cloves, very little. I have a little cayenne in there as well. Yes. Um, that's going to get things uh, moving. I probably have six or seven other things. I have a couple other herbs that are stringing. Um, I think I had some, I had leftover calendula and yarrow, two other herbs. Um, yarrow is one of the properties of yarrow is it's, it's anti-inflammatory. It's in this, and it's also a styptic, so it helps stop bleeding. Yes. So, um, that's a little bit of that's thrown in there. Calendula also, um, has resins that are highly antimicrobial and it's also healing to the skin. Um, and what do we have in here? This is essentially skin. It's epithelial tissue and, and that's essentially skin. So it's good for that. So I have just, I just threw a bunch of stuff in there and I use that every day. Yeah, yeah, it's a fascinating stuff. So I think we've got some similar ideas there. Although I have not, I have not found a good source of calendula. Uh, okay, I haven't really looked that hard, but uh, I go do a lot with the sea salt and then mix in. Sometimes add a little, a few drops of uh, tea tree oil, which mm. uh, has quite a, quite a uh, interesting antiseptic um, or an almost a local anesthesia. It's it's uh, strong. strong stuff. Yeah. Wow, wonderful stuff! Wow, we've covered a lot of ground here. Yeah. Um, is um, to, I guess is there anything else that comes to mind you'd like to add, like to recap um, any of the anything we've that we've we've talked about? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, just a, a couple points that I'd love to make. You know, about herbs is um, there's a lot of potential in how they're used, and um, a lot of that knowledge is. It's there around the world, but in in modern in societies that are more modern um, or more like the developed world, you can say a lot of this knowledge has not been um, hasn't been passed on, uh, and so there's just remember there's a lot of potential with herbs. We just don't know a lot, and we've lost a lot. So um, that's one piece. The other thing is is to be able to use herbs effectively, using them as self care is one method. But um, if that doesn't work, it's not because it's not all the time. It's because you didn't use the right, uh, or the herbs don't work. It's there's many factors. You probably maybe have not used them in the right way. You didn't. You maybe use the right herb. Maybe it's the product. Um, it's it's a you know, and you're working with somebody that that knows how to use them. You can get a lot better results, and you can work. You can support your body in, in a lot of serious situations. So, um, you know, there's a lot of potential there. That's, that's one of the things that I wanted to mention. And then the last thing is um, herbs. They're not, they're not, they're not, you don't want to match an herb to a condition. That's not how they've been used ever in their history. And that's not how a properly trained herbalist uses them. Um, and I kind of walked through some of those examples today. Right. You know, I showed you some of my thinking and how I would support someone. So someone who has fatigue, I would be working on digestion. Like, where's the link there? Like, you can't make it until I explain how the body works. So, um, and that makes it a little tricky for self-care, you know, because typically people are like, oh, I've got this condition. I should take this herb. It's been shown that it could be useful, but that doesn't mean it always is. And there doesn't mean that there's other herbs that won't be. So that's the starting point. 
And if you still want to go further, you can always seek out a professional that um, is good with using herbs and really tap the potential that they offer. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think it would be maybe an analogy might be um, for people. Almost everyone has access to exercise equipment, yet you know very few people are actually fit and in shape. And, uh, and many of them don't use the equipment correctly. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, when you go, if you go into any gym these days, uh, you know, I oftentimes find that much of what is offered is, is unnecessary, but it's, but it sells the membership of the gym. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the machines, the resistance training machines, for example, are actually things that are good for rehabilitation after yeah. injury. And I, know that because I've had a lot of sports injuries myself, but, but in actuality, you know, the human body works very well without a lot of those, a lot of those things just, and, uh, and so it's good to have an expert to help you with your, to set up your exercise program. And I think you're saying, I think it, we would all benefit from having someone like you, you know, a trained herbalist, uh, who's really studied this. And, uh, and as you, anyone listening to this can tell, you know, your stuff. So, so, uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, yeah. hats off to you. Yeah, thanks. And I I totally tell people like go out and use herbs. Like you should always do as much as you can on your own and only when you're not able to do anything more go seek out somebody because ultimately you should be responsible for what what's going on in your body and do whatever you can on your own. So that is always number 1 um above all, you know. Wonderful. Well, yeah. Uh, one question for people listening to this who might want to find out more information and maybe, you know, the, who might even want to, uh, might want to go a little deeper. Um, how can people, you know, maybe, maybe find, find you online? Um, what would be the best way for people to reach out to you if they wanted to do so? Yeah, I've got my website. Um, it's www.rohanjasani.com, which is my first and last name. Um, and you can, you can find some of the services I offer. You can find content. Um, I'm going to be adding a lot more content, a lot of these things that I touched on today. Um, so it's just slowly ramping up and putting stuff out there. Great. And Rohan, one, one thing I didn't ask you about, how, um, what is your normal procedure when you work with people? Would you, is there a, mm -hmm. um, just, to, just for people out there who are maybe, a lot of people are probably going to be driving when they listen to this or or they might yeah. be at home or they might be doing something else. But if someone's thinking, Hey man, this guy really sounds like he knows what he knows what he's doing. And, and I know I have customers who, who have, you know, are spending well over a hundred bucks a month at, you know, at a, at GNC and uh, mm -hmm. buying a whole bunch of kind of shotgunning vitamins. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think yeah. some, I oftentimes tell them, Hey, listen, let's, let's stop doing that. And let's take a look at your, look at some other things, invest that money in a better way. And, um, uh, what would, how would yeah. you work with people normally? Yeah. I mean, you, what you just said brought up a, a number of points. Um, and I'll touch on just a few of those. So the way that I, one of the ways that I work right now is I, um, I offer two services, uh, basically it's a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Um, one is a, a very short one. It's like 30 minutes. Um, and there's just a very basic kind of questionnaire I have to ask, to get a feel for what's going on and what your goals are. Um, and I, in that, at the end, basically, you know, I'll, give you some recommendations for over-the-counter supplements. Um, and I basically, in that session, it's, it's like 30 minutes. It's very simple. The, the main one that I usually work with people on is, is a consultation where um, I basically walk through everything from, you know, what are they looking for? What are their main reasons for coming in? And then I kind of walk through things like their symptoms, um, what's going on in the different systems of their body. I look at very basic things um, like your, your different, your bowel movements and what's going on with that. I look at those two types of things. I look at history, what medications are on. I kind of walk through all of that and just have a discussion with them to get a feel for what's going on. And, um, based on that and their goals, then, you know, I'll make some recommendations and the recommendations will be a couple things. They could be diet recommendations. They could be lifestyle recommendations. Um, and lifestyle could be everything from related to sleep. It could be like, try this relaxation technique, et cetera. And then herbally in that particular service, what I offer is a custom formulation. So I work with a dispensary that has the raw herbs and extracts that oh, brilliant. Are, are, are quality controlled. Um, I've seen the procedures because I've worked in the dispensary before, um, and they source from organic producers. So it all checks out quality wise. And then the added benefit is, is I custom formulate for that person. So if someone is taking like maybe 10 supplements for all these different things, 
when you work with me, you're not, you don't have to take the sin supplements because I'm making something custom for you. So you cut out all the other stuff and I'm optimizing the co combination of the two. So this is particularly designed for your situation, what you, your goals are. And so what ends up happening is it's less you have to take. Um, usually it's more effective and then um, it's cheaper. So right. Right. Wow. That's, that, that, sounds, yeah. that sounds fascinating. So you're able to, to do not only to create a customized program and then actually uh, create a customized herbal blend based on the needs yeah. of, of the person. Yeah, it's a pro I'll, the protocol is customized to that particular person. Yeah, yeah. wow, fascinating. I don't, don't know anyone else who's doing that. I'm sure there must be some people out there, but uh, that's, uh, yeah. that's, that's great. It, it's actually, I mean, it's the way that herbs were used. I mean, uh, this is how herbs were used in every tradition around the world. It's just... Um, I can't speak for other markets outside of the U.S., but predominantly in the U.S., people use over-the-counter supplements, yes. which is fine, pre-formulated, but it's not really tapping the full potential of the herbs um, because they were never done – they weren't exactly you know, used like that. Right. They are used in these formulas that were customized based on what the needs of the person was, based on whatever practitioner was able to assess. So um, you're, ta you're getting a lot more – it's going to be a lot more effective with this route, which is actually in line with tradition. Yeah, no, that's fascinating stuff here. Um, yeah, here in, in the, well, of course, throughout the Mediterranean, there was a long tradition, as you can well imagine, of, of herbs. But during the uh, the middle, the post middle, the, the middle, late Middle Ages uh, and mid Middle Ages, you had the uh, there were there was a time when, uh, just like in in the U.S. history with the Salem witch trials, where people who were the herbal practitioners were sort of looked upon with suspicion as and they were accused of witchcraft and all this crazy stuff, and so it was yeah. sort of uh, it became dangerous to uh, to be the you know the wise person who was dealing with the herbs, and uh, so that was I think a lot of the tradition was lost, but it's starting to come back here a bit. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a trend for it to come back, and it's I mean rightfully so. We, I mean it's. I don't know how to put it into words, but, you know, having a, a situation where you don't have access to a lot of different ways to support your health. Um, herbs are just one. There's many other things that you can do to support your health, you know, whether it's yoga or acupuncture. Um, as a, you know, as a citizen or just a human being, you should have access to whatever is available. But unfortunately, for a good portion of the 20th century, there wasn't a lot of access to these approaches. And now it's coming back. Um, and I think it's to the benefit of, of each one of us. So um, I'm just doing my part with one particular method and it's how, how to use herbs. And it's not the only one. There's many. So. Fantastic. That's great stuff, man. Well